It's every couple's and Instagram influencer's dream destination, Venice, Italy. The stunning architecture, incredible food, and the picturesque gondolas on the canals. The floating city on the water captivates the world's imagination. But of the millions of tourists that crowd Venice every year, how many stop to think, wait, why build a city on the water to begin with? Wouldn't something like, I don't know, land be a better option? That's an excellent question, and one that our team of experts and researchers immediately set out to answer. Picture this, it's the 5th century AD, and the Western Roman Empire has just epically fallen, all while the Byzantine Empire firmly keeps its airpods in, refusing to hear Rome's cries for help. To be fair to the Byzantines, centuries of lead consumption via drinking water was never going to end well for Rome. With the empire's defenses and army destroyed and disbanded, the path is open for invading forces to work their way across Italy. Numerous barbarian armies, including the famed forces of Attila the Hun, attack the major Italian cities. Even though the Veneti people still technically belong to the Eastern Roman Empire, they're right on the border, and their distance from the capital makes it hard for Constantinople to defend them. In the midst of the chaos, the future of a little chain of nearby marshy islands is about to change forever. The group of 118 or 124 islands – sources differ on the exact number – that existed where present-day Venice now sits were thought of as little more than small plots of useless soil in marshland. A few poor fishermen lived there and almost no one else. On the mainland, however, along the coast across from these islands lived a Celtic group known as the Veneti. The first foreign attack comes from the Visigoths in the early 5th century. As the Visigoths approach the city on foot and horseback, terrifying the population, the residents have a light bulb moment. An army of horses and men can't cross the water. Thus, the Veneti pack up their things into boats and move across the Canale della Gudeca, which separates the island chain from the mainland, to the marsh that they had so looked down on before. Specifically, they settle on the sandy stretches of Torcello, Gesolo, and Malamocco. In 421 AD, the Veneti officially establish a city on the island, which they call, unimaginatively, Venice, or Venezia in Italian, or Venezia in Venetian, because each town, street, and house in Italy has its own dialect. Some mainland residents hold out, preferring to face the onslaught of repeated military campaigns against them instead of abandoning their homes and relocating to a marsh. Like the usual Florida residents on the news who refuse to leave their living room while a hurricane is barreling toward them, their stubbornness is somewhat admirable, but it turns out to be a very bad idea. Then after an attack by one of the most famous and feared generals of all time, Attila the Hun, followed by repeated threats from Franks and Turks, most residents end up deciding that maybe fleeing across the water isn't such a bad idea. However, this sudden influx of people to a place that had previously housed just a handful of fishermen overwhelmed and overcrowded the small Venetian islands, much like most photo-snapping tourists do today. That's when the Veneti came up with a solution. In order to expand and solidify the city, they would dig up and construct canals and build Venice on the water itself. This would create more space, but it also meant that they would have to build incredibly strong foundations in order to support the weight of an entire city. And in a move that would make Venice the iconic city it is today, they would have to create canals rather than roads. The first step was to dig the canals and make sure they held their shape, without modern machinery. The digging was a long, painstaking process. In order to make sure their work wasn't immediately destroyed, as soon as builders carved out the canals, they hammered in closely stacked stakes on the sides of the waterways. This stopped the water from seeping back into their dirt walls and stopped the dirt walls from falling down. Here, the Veneti also got a little lucky. The wood they used for the stakes was alder wood, which is mostly water resistant. In addition, the bottom of the canals had a layer of solid clay, which helped the waterways naturally keep their shape and helped hold the stakes in place. All the builders had to do is drive the stakes through the top layers of mud and sand to get to the solid clay bottom. The locals then needed some kind of platform on which to place the city's buildings. Surprisingly, the settlers decided the best material to use for the platforms was wood. They built wooden platforms on top of which they would place stone to serve as the new building's foundations. This is where they ran into problem number two. Being a marshland, Venice didn't have much in the way of forests and trees, so the Venetians started importing wood from Croatia, Slovenia, Montenegro, and other nearby destinations accessible by ship. One would think that a city built on wood, moreover wood submerged in water, would quickly devolve into an Atlantis-like situation. However, this is where, once again, for every seeming setback they had, the Venetians also managed to get lucky. Wood usually rots because of a combination of oxygen, moisture, and fungi. However, the water in Venice is salt water. This means not only is it almost completely deprived of oxygen, it also doesn't allow the microorganisms which would induce rotting, most of which are found in fresh water, to form. 
Because the wood in Venice is constantly submerged and never really comes into contact with oxygen, it also prevents rotting. After 1500 years, we can confidently say the wood has held out pretty well so far and managed to avoid collapsing. In fact, the silt and salt in the canal waters have had a bit of an opposite effect. Thanks to those small particles interacting with Venice's foundations over centuries, the wood has ossified into the density and consistency of stone over time. During the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, as the rest of Europe lived through the endless wars and invasions, Venice was allowed to prosper in a way few could have imagined when they first settled on those small islands. The city's location, isolated from mainland Italy, protected it from many potentially destructive attacks and furthermore encouraged the region's independence as well as the development of a massive naval force mostly used for commerce. While Venice was initially overseen by the Exarch of Ravenna, appointed by the Byzantine Empire, the city was connected to Ravenna only by a shipping route and increasingly sought autonomy. Venice selected its first doja. The doja's palace remains one of the city's main attractions today in 697. Paolo Lucio Anafesto. Doja meant leader in the Venetian dialect. After a Lombard king conquered Ravenna in 751 but left Venice untouched, the city became almost fully autonomous. At this point, it was a Byzantine territory in name only. Constantinople had almost no real control over the Venetian region. Thus, by 9th century, Venice would become its own city-state. At its peak, Venice had acquired multiple territories on the eastern Adriatic coast. Many Greek islands, including Crete and the entire territory of Cyprus. However, this was more for commercial rather than military reasons. Venetians were merchants, first and foremost. Their primary goal was to establish and maintain peaceful trade routes throughout the Adriatic and Mediterranean region. Wherever they encountered pirates, such as in the aforementioned territories, they would take over in order to secure those particular trade routes and drive the pirates out. It was at this point of Venice's power that none other than Charlemagne himself decided to invade that jewel of the Adriatic. His son, Pepin of Italy, laid siege to the city of Venice. This would turn out to be a horrendously expensive and embarrassing mistake. For six months, while Venetians curiously looked on Pepin's adorable attempts at a siege while going about their daily lives, Pepin's forces were completely subdued by the diseases found in the local marshes. Presumably, the local Venetians had learned to prevent, treat them, or had adapted to them and were relatively unaffected. In 810 AD, with his army devastated by swampland and no sign of anything approximating surrender from Venice, Pepin tucked his tail between his legs and headed home. After countless effortless victories against outside invaders, plus multiple trade routes and territorial acquisitions, Venice became one of the most prosperous city-states in Europe. However, starting in 1453, when the Ottoman Empire defeated the Byzantine Empire and seized most of Venice's land, the city started to decline from its former heights, though it continued to maintain some level of influence and importance, as even in the mid-1500s the city's population numbered 170,000. Most of Venice's meteoric rise and development would have been almost impossible without the benefit of the city's unique construction and location, which enabled it to avoid too much unwanted interference from the outside world. However, in an ironic turn of events, feel free to argue in the comments about whether this is the correct use of ironic or not, the source of Venice's rise in prosperity may prove to be the source of its downfall. Today, Venice does quite well for itself as one of the most sought-after tourist destinations in the world. However, there is a very real danger that the floating city is quickly becoming the sinking city. In the last century, scientists estimate that Venice has sunk by 9 inches. This may not seem like a lot, talking about the sea level, gentlemen. But for a city built on water, it's concerning. The problem has partly existed from the start. The weight of the city has always, and now continues, to push the foundations downward to the ground, submerging the city little by little. However, other factors have compounded the city's submersion. One was the genius idea in the 1960s to drill artisanal wells in order to gain better access to drinking water, which has historically been a problem for this little saltwater surrounded area. Engineers drilled way past the wooden piles the city rested on onto the hard clay bottom of the canals. This weakened the structural integrity and stability of the wood, which had the effect of making the city sink even faster. Once they realized the problems the wells were causing, they stopped drilling immediately. Wells are now banned in Venice, however, the damage was already done. In addition, the buildings lining the canals themselves are being affected by the startling increase in water traffic. The amount of motorized traffic in the Venetian canals has almost doubled in the last 10 years alone. The massive increase in tourism has been a big driver of that traffic. Though the Greater Venice area is home to around 262,000 people, the historic city of Venice, which sits on the water, is home to only around 60,000. And yet, in 2019, the famous city recorded 4.78 million inbound tourists. That's almost 80 times the Venetian population. Lastly, the big problem putting Venice on high alert is something most of the world is also worried about – climate change. 
Though Venice has slowly been sinking for centuries, the accelerating rise in sea levels threatens to make this city unlivable much sooner than previously thought. In addition, anyone who has spent a number of days in Venice can attest to the city's propensity to unexpectedly become a wading pool at times. Especially in the winter, strong winds and storm surges cause flooding throughout the city, a phenomenon known as aqua alta, or high water. However, climate change has affected weather patterns and increased the sea level, which has led to much more frequent flooding throughout the year, damaging and eroding the city at a much faster rate. Some scientists and engineers have proposed possible solutions to prevent Venice from being lost to the sea. One of these is called the MOS, the acronym for Modulo Sperimentale Electromeccanico, an ambitious project that involves the construction of 79 mobile floodgates. When the tides rise more than 1 meter, approximately 3.3 feet, above the high water mark, these floodgates will kick into operation and keep the Venetian lagoon separated from the Adriatic Sea. Some have suggested even more extreme plans, such as stopping and reversing climate change so hopefully there are still humans on Earth to worry about Venice sinking from the weight of its structures. However, this has been deemed as an unrealistic goal by a whole lot of important people who have at best 15 years left on the Earth. Though we may not know Venice's eventual fate, we know that this unique city was built in the most ingenious of ways and that its construction and location led it to thrive and prosper for over a millennium. Famous Russian writer Alexander Herzen said this about Venice, To build a city where it's impossible to build a city is madness in itself, but to build there one of the most elegant and grandest of cities is the madness of genius. Now that you learned all about why humans in the 400s wanted to build a city on the water, do you want to go see Venice, presumably before it sinks? While you're deciding on whether to book your ticket, you can keep watching more fun videos by clicking here or perhaps here instead.